Up next, a friend of mine, Tom Cotter, is going to follow up with what he talked about yesterday from his, his farm in, in southern Minnesota, uh, looking at um, a, a, lot of, a lot of things he's got going on. Plus, yesterday I forgot to mention that he's, he's also a hemp grower and has a hemp uh, selling business. So I know there's a lot of interest in that topic. So I don't know if you're going to touch on that now, but for sure on the break, you might want to visit with him on his learnings there because that is certainly the wild west of production agriculture right now. So anyway, um, Tom, looking forward to what you got to share with us. All right. All right. Good morning. How is everyone today? All right. I appreciate you guys coming here today. Uh, it's quite different for me being a young farmer and a dad that was a storyteller and he always said you know you gotta get out and tell a story and cannot believe how bad I fought that <laughs> and then you know what here I am it's like thank you dad but uh, so this is a home farm he always told me take care of the land and it'll take care of you and I bet you uh, a bunch of your dads and grandparents said that to you guys too so at least I hope they did because that's vitally important now, in 2016, I was certified clean water farm. You know how I got it? I have no idea. I was just doing the right things. I was just doing what I wanted to do, and it just kind of fell into my lap. And as I go through this presentation, everything just kind of fell right into line. So I was pretty happy that my dad passed away in 17, but he got to see this. So that was super important to me. But on another note, I'm going to tell you something else about myself, because I like to show you what I do there, but I want to show you a little bit of myself internally, too. I'm adopted. And so this man and my mom adopted me when I was about two months old, thank God. And I had a great life. But as a kid growing up, I was always very thankful. I was thankful for everything that was given to me, everything that happened. And then he passed away, and that was hard. And then this year, lo and behold, I found my adopted, or my biological dad. And the story there is, I wasn't looking for nothing. I had the best damn dad you could ever get, and mom. But I did want to say thank you to him, even though he never knew I was born. But I told him, I called him up, and we, you know, it took him about five days to sink in, and he said, okay, I'm ready to talk, because he was worried. And I said, no. Great dad, great mom, wonderful life, wonderful family. My sitting right here, very thankful. And he was very happy because what else do you want? You know, to be thankful. Now I have another best friend. You know, I can't, you know, sometimes I might say dad, but this is my dad. And Chuck, my biological dad, is just my best friend now. So something about me. All right, how do we get to healthy soils? Everyone always says that. There's a bunch of banners over there. And, I, of course, I got to go through and do the same mumbo-jumbo. But, you know, armor, shelter, feed the soil. You can build a house, but if there's no food in there, how long is that house going to be full of people, full of microbes, full of life? So make sure you're doing everything. And now that's actually our farm right there, right up there. I like to throw a yellow barn in there because there's not many barns left around because all this landscape has been desolated. And it's big grain bins, and that's about it. No livestock, no nothing. I want to keep my tradition, you know, that my dad gave me. So armor, shelter, feed the soil. There's lots of things in these principles that I think people miss out on. Now, I'm sheltering the top, but really... That's what matters. Get those roots in the ground. You need to have growth. You need to have something there. Because for me, in the wintertime, when the top dies off, I want to make sure those roots are in place to hold everything. And I can survive a winter. I can survive 30 below because I have a good root structure going down however deep it wants to go. I make sure I don't wreck it either. Now, minimize soil disturbance, absolutely. Less tillage, the better. I told you, for 143 years, 
our farm, well, about, no, about 135, our farm did tillage. My great-grandpa did it, my grandpa, my dad, and they had to. It was vital for them to succeed back then. But as time has changed, so must we. So make sure you guys you know, respect your elders, respect what they did and how they did it, because they did it right and they succeeded. But now it's your guys' turn to actually pick it up and keep on going and bring it to the next level. Plant diversity, that's my favorite one. Well, one of my favorites. I love that because you know what? To me, oh, hang on. What do you guys see there? Monty? Steak in the making. Steak in the making. What else? <laughs> Antonio? Life. Life? Absolutely. I see a community. And the best part is underground. What do you think that looks like? I see a huge community built of school teachers, doctors, janitors, cooks, everything you need to make a community. Because how am I going to raise food if I don't have a community to use it, to make it, to do everything? All right? And I love all around, the, all around there. Every size, depth, range, everything you want is in diversity. And that's how I get my microbe colonies. You know, and Dr. Bush is going to be talking about that. And that just, you can't get in your gut if you don't get it in the ground. We've killed all that, but the more you do this, the more diversity you get, the more biology, microbe communities you can have in the soil. Now, continuous living root. That one right there, that's about five days ago. I threw that one on Facebook because I'm still grazing. It's still green, and I love it. And of course, this is interseeding in the corn, which I, I do, and that's in the fall. I graze that. And that brings me to my next livestock integration. Man, I want to get those livestock out there because that is the way you really ramp up the soil. I did cover crops. I did started two years after you were born, Brandon, 1998. And I did cereal rye. Well, first I did rapeseed, one single species. And then I did rye. And I stuck with rye for a whole bunch of years. And just like Beck was talking about, uh-oh, now I'm in a monoculture of corn, rye, beans, rye, corn. You know, I thought, there's got to be more. You know, I'm only building one community of microbes. I put a bunch of diversity in there, and then I put the livestock in there. That's when soil life will explode. You will not slow it down when you put those out there. Everything they do from urine to out the back end to tugging on the plants and saliva from the mouth, oh man. Microbe galore. That's what I want. Now, this one gets left out a little bit. Yesterday, I know someone put in there is, you know, soil disturbance. But we're really good at saying, okay, soil disturbance, it's just tillage. And no one forgets about chemical. And I remember I had a really rude awakening once at the MOSA conference in La Crosse, Wisconsin. A, a doctor on uh, mushrooms was talking. And I said, okay, Mike, I, I'm high on mycorrhizal fungi. What's worse, tillage or chemical? And he said a real simple question, which goes deeper? Which goes deeper in the soil? Definitely chemical. Now, we all use chemical. It makes life so much easy. But all I'm asking is that you think about it. You know, Roundup made us lazy, stupid, ignorant. Start thinking about what you're doing. When you put livestock in there, you got to start reading labels because you have restrictions that you have to watch. So I intercede in the V6 corner. I, I read about 40 different labels. Has it made me smarter? Probably not. Has it made me more, more knowledgeable? Yes. And half the time when I go ask the dealers, they don't know what the heck that stuff is anyways. So just be mindful with whatever chemicals you use. Usually if it's the biggest, best chemical out there, it's probably the worst one too. All right? 
So try and get by this. And the reason why I have that picture, because that is my chemical program. That's my weed program. Every spring, I go out and I rank my fields. All right, this is a field. This is a great, beautiful cover crop. I can reduce chemical. If I had a hard year and nothing really grow good, chances are I'm going to have to go with a little more chemical program. But I adjust. And I hate these dealers that come around and they want to stick me for money you know, at harvest time for next year. Everything is changing, so why don't you field by field start looking at what you need to use? Now, soil health has a ripple effect. Sorry, Vanessa. I love this picture. That's my daughter Vanessa and my grandson Julian. Look at the ripple effect that is having. Beautiful plants, healthy soil, healthy livestock. Now they get a, a variety of food, healthy children. It's limitless. So, ripple effect. Healthy soil, increased carbon, increased water holding capacity. We've, Beck was just talking about all this stuff. Absolutely. You can have a ripple effect that's good, and you can have a ripple effect that's bad. What if you come down to unhealthy soil? Decreased soil carbon, decreased water. Oh man, that's my gas tank. Water is my fuel for my crop. Now, yesterday I talked about Oaxaca, Mexico. I went down there, I shut up, I listened, and they also talked about rich water, poor water. Does anyone know rich water, poor water? It came from the indigenous people down there, and man, I love it. Because really, rich water falls from the sky. It hits your soil, it absorbs in, right there, increased water holding capacity, infiltration. It absorbs through the soil, picks up minerals, goes down to the aquifers, and when you want water, you can go down to the aquifers, and you can pump up healthy, you know, life-sustaining water. Now, if you have unhealthy dead soil, poor water, it hits the ground, it runs off, it takes all your nutrients, takes all these chemicals, and now you're drinking, guess what? Poor water, because it's poor for your health, but it also made you a whole lot poorer because it took all your nutrients, all your best soil is there. So rich water, poor water. Now, soil health back on environment. I talked a little bit about it yesterday. I'll go a little more deeper. This is my neighbor's field. Right across the fence row from mine. I would be absolutely devastated if I let my soil get like that. Why are we doing this? Up in Minnesota, it's because we got to get warm. We got to warm up the soil. We have to do tillage because John Deere sold me this big equipment. Think about what you're doing. The more you beat it up, the sandier it gets. You know what Alan Savory would say? That looks like desertification. How much life is in that? And that, we should be ashamed, embarrassed, that's not what I want for the farmers south of me. You guys are to the west, so I don't really affect you. But people to the south of me, every farmer there I affect. The fishermen out in the dead zones, they are farmers too. They are people too. I'm wrecking their business. I don't want to do that. I have a conscience. Now, as you can see, water, wind, fire, temperature, healthiest soil affects it everything. And if we think we're that far away from your Australia, no we're not. You guys here know the fires. I don't in Minnesota, but if I keep going like that, someday I might. Now, you have the bad ripple effects of soil health. How about the good ones? I see beautiful life there. But guess what? That had pretty bad stuff too. That's Chernobyl. Can you imagine anything much worse than that? But guess what? It had time to reheal. We took people out of the equation and we let soil health and soil life and microbes do the work. Get rid of man. And they'll survive. 
Bush told us yesterday that they have a way more diverse DNA and all that than we do, so they're equipped to survive. We're not. All right? I love that picture because that just means that no matter how bad it gets, we can save it. Now, so I'll back to the economy. I'm a farmer, so I got to live in the real world. And tell you what, we're right up there with mail carriers. Email, snail mail, I can see why that's happening. I really have a hard, whoop, I really have a hard time seeing why. I can see how people don't need to get mail, but don't they need food? Holy cows. Auto, automation is great, but then why does Monsanto need me? They can buy more land than me. They can buy more tractors than me. If all of a sudden everything's automated, then my job's gone. And guess what? I met my wife at the canning company. There were 300 girls there, and I saw her, and I said, that's the woman I want. <laughs> guess what? Ten years later, we went back to that same place. How many people were working there on that same line? Ten. Holy cows, how do you survive a community when you, you just took away all those jobs? Made someone richer. It wasn't the community. It was probably one person or one, you know, proprietor, or whatever. But that's scary. But guess what? My pioneer dealer always tells me yields are on a rise, but so are expenses. Land cost outrageous. Machinery outrageous. Seed outrageous. Every one of those is outrageous. Labor. I'm kind of torn on that one because it should be cheap, but yet we don't have labor out there that can help us. People are lazy nowadays. Too much autom automation, too, much, too easy for kids. You know, every college kid used to go back and work a full-time job. Now they get to travel the world and do whatever, but, you know, that's not how you make a community. Bankruptcies. Look at that, 25 out in the California region, 240 in the Midwest. Holy cows, who's controlling the food? Who's raising the food? Now, before I showed you how environmentally and economically one was big, one was small, now they're even. Because how has, how has soil health helped me? I can't divide those because to me, it's together. It's so intertwined that I just can't pull them apart because every time I do one thing, it affects the other. Right here, this is my neighbor, this is my cousin. I get along with a great, great guy. I tiled his ground. I used to have a tile, I do have a tile plow. I haven't used it for about eight years, but I tiled his ground and I, I did a good job. So don't, I mean, the water staying there is just because we had a lot of water. But usually the water would sit on my side a lot worse. But I interceded into that. And that's something I did the year before. And guess what? The next year, I got to go out and graze that when I ran out of feed for my cattle. Come April, I ran out of feed. And I thought, oh boy, I'm going to spend a lot of money. But guess what? I put a crop out there, interceded into corn. Corn was harvested, corn was gone. But what I put down there was a living root. Look how beautiful that is. My cattle got to go out and graze, and it was so wet out in every field, you couldn't do nothing. And I got to drive around my ranger like nothing. My cows were out there, absolutely not leaving a track. Healthy damn cows. Those guys yesterday on the farmer panel, I think it was Kerry said it, get the word out. I put pictures up like this. I got people flocking to want my product. Now, I don't like putting numbers up because I don't want to give you guys numbers. I want to give you guys ideas. And like Beck just said, I can't pick your wife for you. And I can't pick your idea for you. But I want you to learn to make your own ideas. But right here is one, one of the few times I will give you numbers because that's how much money I would have spent. You know, one month would have been $3,000. To a young family, that's a lot of money. Now, four to seven months, this slide is actually pretty old because now I'm more like 10 months grazing. 
I'm just getting better and better and better at how I'm doing things. And you will too, if you try. Another numbers. I don't like to talk yield because my corn yields aren't, I don't blow people away. I'm just, I'm average, but my expenses are way lower. These fields right here, I guarantee you, my fertility is way lower. Because every damn soil test comes back, I need this, 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 and this. And every year, I beat them. Every year, every time, I'm beating them. And guess what? I'm not putting chemical on. And who was it yesterday in the, the red shirt saying that, well, why aren't we getting paid more money for this? Who was that? Shannon. Shannon. We can. And I say the exact same thing. I tell, when my canning company guy came and asked for the program, uh, how much chemical I use, I said, oh, I put the pre down, and then nothing else. He's like, what? He's like, yeah, you should pay me more damn money because I am making a better product. And he was right. And hopefully blockchain can help us get us there. But until then, you need to promote yourself. You need to promote what you're doing. Now, these guys, it blew me away. He tilled the ground twice and then had to irrigate to germinate his corn because it was so dry. In Minnesota, the land of 40 inches of rain. It just blew me away. Now, so economically, yes. But how about healthy? How about better tasting? They definitely thought so. So it's more than just environmentally and economically. It's also health care, healthy people. You know, Get those microbes in your gut. That's how you get healthy. Why do you think depression and all those diseases are so high? Because we've stripped away the microbes in the soil. And I really want to give a good shout out. Shout out. Take a picture because I want to be known for in the California area, <laughs> focusing on the Vikings, guys. All right? Well, we'll see how it goes. San Fran looks good, but I'm faithful. Always been faithful. Now, you do all this, man, do they come. And you can do it with a monocrop. You get some worms, and you can get diversity, and you can get some more. You get a livestock, you get a lot more. You use less chemical, and it helps you even more. Everything you do, there's a ripple effect. You guys decide which way it's going to go. Me, I have not put lime on. I've put lime on twice in the last 12 years, and really only on like 120 acres one year and 80 the other year. And I, have, I run 1,000 acres. How am I getting good yields? I forgot to put it up. Oop, I forgot to get it up there, but worms, everything that comes out of them is 7.0. Balanced, perfect, everything. Now, do they make the fertilizer? No. But they go through and they eat, and then it gets concentrated out into their castings, their lining. And then guess what? When my corn is growing, and it's that first week of growth, and it's trying to break through that tilled ground, that sandy soil, and it's having a hard time. Mine jumps in on the earthworm and just flies right down that hole, grabs the water, grabs nutrients. Win-win situation. Now, what else has healthy soil done for me? It got me into organic crops. Was I planning on it? No. Was I working with plants? Yes. I learned that the better I do on my plants and my cover crops, the cleaner my fields. And then if I can do that, why not get more money? I figured it out this morning. Oop. That right there, for me, is worth five cents. Every, every year was five cents. And in conventional, it was worth 2.2 cents per ear. My neighbor laughed and I said, oh, I got 150 bushel. It really was more like 180, but when I spread my manure on the headlands, I really, I kind of wrecked it. And that was my fault. Every time I make a mistake, I try and learn from it. But guess what? To match my 150 acres or bushels, Jim, as his name, my friend, said you'd have to raise 424 bushel. And you got fertilized 424 bushel. 
And you got, when you do that, you're going to have more weeds because you're going to put more fertilizer out there. You're going to have to truck it. You're going to have to dry it. I only had 150 bushel. It was easy to move haul. I made way more money. Is everything organic? No, because I like to, I like to have diversity. I like my conventional ground that I can really play with on my covers. In organic ground, I got cattle, so if I have a mistake, I can turn around and I can still learn from it. This, this last year, I tried strip till sweet organic sweet corn and alfalfa ground, and it was a disaster. But so were four of the other five fields around the area that all did tillage. So what did I do? I did strip till and I planted. That was it. Those guys did a bunch of tillage, a bunch of other stuff, still a failure. But guess what? I left it. I had alfalfa grow in the middle. I turned back around and I got to feed, cut all that off for feed, and I got forage. So that's a win. I also, in that failure, I went out and changed my view, how I looked at it, and realized that where I bale grazed last year, that's the most beautiful corn out there. I learned something from my failure, so please do that. Now, also became a seed dealer, mentor. Seed dealer, yes. Salesman, I'm the worst around. I couldn't sell water to someone in the desert because I remember I'm thankful for things. So I'm not really after to try and get money out of you. I'm after to help you. And this is probably the best thing that's ever happened because, well, no, sorry, kids. In life. <laughs> it's, it's really helped me get around and help people. Custom seeding opportunities. Man, if you're a dad and you got a kid that wants to get into ag and you got all this big equipment sitting there, oh, but there's not enough room for you to come back, son. Yeah, there is. Get out there. If you get out there and you help people get into this, strip till machines, seeding equipment, farmers will use it if it's available. Now, me, Looks like I'm taking out corn, but that's actually sorghum sedan. That was a field that I had already grazed. I was thinking, I, was, I put my chest hat on. And I said, okay, I got this great crop. They've already grazed it. But I got to think about what's going to be there next year. So I wanted to make sure I got out there and plant some more stuff to help me keep going. Grass finished beef. You guys are all cutting corn silage? I used to too. Guess what? Now I get to sell that. Because my dad always said, the damn problem with all those cover crops is we need more cows. I thought, well, hey, that's, so that means we got a lot of feed. We got a lot of free feed. We got a lot of good feed. Put it in the cows. And guess what? I put it online. When I haul that into the butcher shop, I can get in my truck with the trailer. It's a half-hour drive. I can put on Facebook, four head of grass-fed beef. By the time I get there, 99% of the time, I can have those all sold. That's nice. Hemp production. What if I ever got into hemp? If I wasn't doing all this stuff of working with plants, probably not. And I look around, I see all these hemp fields where it's bare in this middle. And I'm thinking, okay, you want to take God's healthiest plant that's supposed to help people and cure people and you're going to raise it in unhealthy soil, beat the crap soil, so I make sure that I have covers out there. And actually, this field, I should have put a picture up, but that was 10 feet tall biomass the year before. About mid-September, I went in there, and I thought, okay, I got so much stuff, and I kind of, my cattle are all grazing somewhere else I'm not going to get to. I'm just going to go lay it down. It was about that thick. It was sunflowers, sorghum, everything. Style Butte gives me these sample packs of just see what you can grow. So I threw them out there, and I had a lot of stuff. But I laid it down the next year. You see any residue on the ground? Man, my soil life devoured that like you wouldn't believe. And guess what? That's really heavy soil. Hemp doesn't like heavy soil, wet feet. In Minnesota, we had a wet year. After every single rain, I walked right across that field like nothing. Wow. Do I feel like I'm putting out a better plant, better product? Absolutely. How about community support? We talked about how ag people are always villainized. Well, guess what? No, I'm not. I show them. I put my pictures up. I make sure people know what's going on there. 
How about outreach and education? I love that because for 20 years, well, not 20 years, the first 12 years of doing covers, I had no one to talk to. Every agronomist said, no, you can't do it. I sat here last night and I had to eat my words because I watched your group up here, the agronomists. Wow, absolutely awesome. I was just blown away. It's like, we got these new agronomists. They know the difference. They are changing. And you saw the excitement in Rob, right? That was really cool. In fact, I told him, you son of a gun, now I got to go back and change my slide. But I fell asleep when I started doing it, so I didn't get to. But I've always been so excited about how future generations are excited about egg. Now I got to say, so are the old timers. He was going to retire. What a shame to have a guy like that leave egg. You know, there's a ton of wisdom there. And it just goes to show, you know, never too old to learn new tricks. Now, what does it take to be a leader? I need some help here, guys. Influence. Keith, what's that? Influence. Influence. Over here, what's it take to be a leader? Lead by example. Lead by example. Hun, can you write that down? Because I have really no clue what it takes to be a leader. But I do know, my wife always says, don't be a follower. All these guys, they're not, they're not leading. They're not thinking for themselves. They're just following. They're doing the same thing everyone else is doing, and let's just keep on doing it. Let's drive right over that cliff. Now, I've heard it from my wife many times. My kids have heard it a million times. But just think about that. Don't follow. Make your own path. Now, we talk about what soil health can do to, for us. What can we do for soil health? That's probably the more important question, because what, what's more important, humans or Earth? Chernobyl showed us that, you know, we really don't matter. You know, life will go on without us. Soil health is vital important, so what can I do? Well, first of all, question everything. Right, hon? <laughs> she says that too. I use a lot of my wife stuff. You should be up here. <laughs> but, you know, question everything. Why am I putting that on? Why am I using this? Why does that chemical kill everything there but not hurt anything else? It really amazes me. You know, I do a V6 intercene. I can put these chemicals out there. And, oh, it's okay to put on sweet corn ground that we are going to eat but you can't put it on something that the cows are going to graze and go through a cycle. Why is that? So question everything, guys. Question me. Question Keith, Monty, everyone, Delaney. I start with seeds. You know, Bush talked about this chain two million times around the earth. I would like to know what a seed blueprint looks like. All the DNA that's in that. Holy cows. You can grow a what? A big redwood tree out of a little seed, right? There's so much life out there, we just have to give it a chance. Seeds, and really, you know, you need sunlight, you need moisture, but yet how come every time when I leave a little seed in the drill or planter in the shed, I come back and something's growing? Life wants to grow. I use roots, awesome roots. Yeah. And really, this one time I'm going to say, size doesn't matter, okay? <laughs> because really, <laughs> I can't believe I just said that. All right. uh, radish, radishes are big. Everyone's like, oh, we got to have that radish. No, you don't. I want that little ones, you know? That's what's really doing the work. That's what's going to go split a tree or split a rock. A tree's going to split a rock. All right, guys? And now remember, question everything. So what, what's the best root out there? What do you think? What's the best? What's nice looking root? Probably fibrous root. Fibrous root? How about a live one? There you go. 
Yeah, I know I killed it. But really, look at that one. Man, that's just that's a pretty nice looking root. Question everything. Oh, by the way, that's a weed. That's a weed. Oh, I should kill that, even though it's the best root, root out there. And guess what? My peas this year, when they came to plant my peas this year, the planter guys were laughing and making fun of my field. And I said, well, my sweet corn was the second best last year. The peas, well, the peas aren't going to do that. So they came in, they planted the peas. When they came to harvest, I had weeds. I had actually more weeds than I wanted. I thought, oh, guess what? The field man called me that morning, like at 5 in the morning. Hey, are they, are they in the other field yet? I'm like, no. I'm like, well, holy cow, your field is running 6,200 pounds per acre. The average was 4,200. So guess who's going to be sitting out there waiting for those tractor guys next spring? <laughs> I'll be rubbing their face, and I'll say, oh, yeah, hey, remember that? Remember that weeds out there? And all those, you know, they call them weeds. I call them plants because I want them. Roots. All right, guys? Question everything. When there's weeds out there, it does not mean that you have to go get your agronomist and find the best chemical to kill it. You need to figure out why the hell that plant is there. What is wrong? All right? Indigenous people know it. Native Americans know it. White man is dumb as a rock, and they can't figure it out. Now, planting covers, yeah, jack of all trades. I need to be very flexible with what I do out there. Because if I get in the mode of just only planting one way, chances are in Minnesota you're going to have a failure. Because i got to deal with rain, i got to deal with weather, everything. Even just, you know, family life. I need to be flexible how I plant. So, how do I get the roots in the ground? For me, it's going to be different. Same basic ideas for you guys, though, but... Springtime, I want frosty. I want to get something out there in those spots that I'm maybe worried about. That maybe, you know, come January. Oh, you guys don't have this in down here, do you? In January, when it thaws up and all that snow melts and the water runs and it sits in about three acres and it's about 100 acres worth of water, guess what? My cover crop is probably not going to survive there. I just choked it out because it needs oxygen. I just suffocate it. So when I, in the spring, I know those spots, I'll run out and I'll spread some seed. And especially in the organic world, I really want to make sure I spread the seed because I, that's my chemical program. Early summer, V3, V6 interseeding, it's another route to get another plant in the ground. Midsummer, that's, of course, that's my favorite. That's my bread and butter. That's my chest move. That's when I can go out there and I can put massive covers and really explode the soil. Give it a big, huge energy drink of life. Microbes. Everything that it could possibly want. And then I make sure I maintain it for a couple of years till I can come back with a rotation, a diverse rotation, and do it again. After harvest, for me, I need to get in the ground because it's pretty cold up there. If I get in the ground, I know the next spring, a winter rye will come back. You guys down here, man, I could just, I dream of what I could do with covers down here. You guys have such an awesome opportunity. Different plants, no doubt about it, you guys need to learn those plants. Now, right there, Johnny Appleseed. If you have not got a cover, grab a bag, walk out there, and throw it. Because if you don't put something out there, how are you ever going to know? I can talk all I want, Monty, Keith, everyone. But until you experience it yourself, you will never know. So start simple. You don't have to go buy a huge expensive equipment to do it. Me, I use that, that floater right there. Two years ago I had a massive rainstorm right during sweet corn harvest and I'll show that picture. And I thought, boy, in my area, if I don't get a plant now, I'm not going to be able to graze. You know, I need to get something done. Would I usually go out there with a floater? No. Did it work? Yes. Did the scenario call for that? Yes. Oop. Springtime, that. 
situations that, even frost eating. You guys would love to do that, wouldn't you? <laughs> V6 inner seating. Oh, man. I love this because this is a way for me to get, when I was in just a regular corn soybean rotation, it's hard to get diversity out there. This gave me that chance to get more plants out there. But better yet, what do I got right here? I have a shelter. I have a home. But I need to feed it. I need to keep those microbes going. I can buy a bug in a jug, and I can go stick it out in the field, and it'll work for a little while. And then you're going to realize that, oh, I didn't feed them. They're dead now. Now, guess what? I got to buy more. Don't get caught up in that. Raise, feed. I, I, don't, I don't have livestock. My cattle, I don't go through and not feed them. Kind of same thing right here. That's the day after harvest. And tell you what, I need to switch that to the free range vegans. Because you know what? It did smell that good. It smelled just as good as a good steak. I mean, we're combining. I'm calling Tony, my brother in law, right? I'm like, do you smell that? That kale and everything else just put off the best smell. And thank goodness, my superheroes, my cows, their super, you know, powers, they turn that into steak. Oh, yeah. Good steak, too. Almost as good as yours, Monty. And Lat. Everything here has been awesome, so thank you. Now, what do I like to intercede? That's my area. You guys are going to have to figure out yours. And the only way to really figure it out is get some advice, use it, but still focus in on your ground and what works for you. Bounty annual ryegrass, not going to work down here too easy. You guys, I mean, it might eat in the wintertime, but most places it'll get just too hot. But, you know, Bayou Kale, purple, purple Top Turnip, I call that a worm magnet because I've never not pulled up a Purple Top Turnip and had a worm underneath it, not once. 18 minutes. Oh, I'm flying right through this. All right, airplane. I like to do things myself, so I've never even used an airplane. But if you want to try and get covers in your fields, you can fly it on. There's some really good pilots out there, but make sure you find the right pilots. Because I've heard of horror stories of purple top turnips or rashes growing out of the gutters on the neighbors' fields and <laughs> houses. It's real. They, and guess what? Someone's got to pay for that. So it does happen. So there are guys out there. Make sure you find them. For me, they're usually out spraying aphids on the neighbors. I don't have to worry about aphids because I, I work with nature. So... But when they're done with aphids, they switch over and they do a lot of cover crop seeding. So it's an option. For me, it's not the best one. I like to do things myself or have a little better control. A uh, friend of mine, Andy Linder. This is 90-foot haggy. He just, he's selling that. So if anyone wants to buy it, he can because he's going to 120-foot. And I really like this because of that. I graze cattle. My goal off every acre is to not use it for 105 days and then let it sit the rest of the year. One lousy income. I want to make sure I get two incomes. So I graze every acre. Plus I get the ripple effect of health benefits. But now when he comes and does that, if it's a nice warm September in my area, I can graze that. So now I get to graze my uh, canning crop fields, I get to graze my V6 interseeded fields, I get to graze my soybeans. Now I have a thousand acres to play with that I can move cattle around and it's pretty easy. Before when I was doing 50-50, also it took a whole bunch of acres out. And usually it's the closest ones, so thinking of options, guys. Also this, no-till drill. I sure wish that one was mine, no-till drill. I'm a cheap guy, I don't like to spend a lot of money, so I use a vertical till, and I, you just heard Beck talk about even the VT does damage, you're right. So does that though too. Still making a trench, still wrecking five inches. Grant, I'd love to have that. Right now, those, that's my means. 
That little Gandhi air box, you saw that on the V6 interceding? That is my most versatile tool. I take it, I throw on that. When I first started 20 years ago, I bought that at an auction and I put it on a disc, a no-till disc, right back, right? But you know what, I was addicted to tillage. So that was my means of like, okay, I'm gonna do tillage and still plant my covers. It helped me, you know, it's like an alcoholic. You can't just cut all the alcohol and think you're gonna be fine the first day. I weaned myself off of tillage. Grant, nowadays I think you guys better just jump to it and get strictly no-till, but for me at the time, I took it slow, I learned my covers. Now, nowadays, that's how I plant. That's actually a strip-till rig. I got into a quit program. So all of a sudden I got a bunch of money to play with covers. I was already doing covers. So I made sure I wanted to go above and beyond what they required. So I put these huge multi-covers in. I hired strip-till to come in and put my nutrients because I just, my soil was addicted and I needed to slowly wean it off. So I made the fertilizer right there. I built my soil health in between. And after those three years, I had my soil ready to go to no-till corn. And now my no-till corn is just as good as anyone else's conventional corn. No doubt about it. But I used it as a stepping stone, as a transition period. Did I want to go buy a $200,000 you know, strip-till bar? No. That's what it looked like. Most guys say you have to strip-till in the fall. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's not. I wanted to keep that soil life going as much as possible that we control as much as possible. Oh, I did, I'd say those uh, pro stitch closing wheels are the only thing I changed on my planter to go from conventional tillage to no-till. You know, everyone thinks you gotta have a no-till planter. No, you don't. I put the closing wheels and there you go. $1,200, I just, you know, switched my planter. Now, this is probably my favorite slide. Lots of less. Now I need interaction again. Lots of less. Less what? What do you see, Antonio? Less? Uh, less fertilizer. Yeah, yeah. If you're strip tilling, you can cut back. If you're soil health, you can cut back. What else? What's that? Less black dirt. Less black dirt. So less erosion. Less water erosion, less wind erosion, less tillage erosion. Less what? Sides. Sides? Herbicides. Yep. Sides. Yep. Exactly. Absolutely. Come on, there's, there's a million of them. Evaporation. Less evaporation. Beck was talking about temperature. How about less temperature swings? I have a blanket. I've had probes in the ground showing that actually my soil health and cover crop fields are two degrees warmer than my conventional tilled fields. Because I had a Sierra Grand strip where we did 120 foot wide for three quarters of a mile, probes all along it. With soil life and using water too, because that's a big key is when water rains, that's cold. You start using that water, you can warm up faster. So I had less temperature swings. But in the springtime, I was warmer, and guess what? In the summertime, I was what? A little cooler, less, 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 less. How about less bad press? How about less regulations coming if I'm doing things like this? Question everything. It doesn't always have to be more. Less is better, guys. When you're driving home after this event, I really want you guys to think about this because you will come up with at least 10 more things. Less fuel, less machinery, less labor. Grant, I don't like that because I, I hate to see that happen in communities, but you know what? Less health problems. Probably the only thing there's not less of is microbe colonies in the ground. That's how I plant my corn now. That's another grandson. He loves it. This is his saving grace. There's soybeans. I take a million pictures a year. I have over 7,000 pictures on my phone right now. The first time I planted, 
The only thing I used my phone for was calling up TJ, a friend of mine, and said, you SOB, you know, what's going to happen when this doesn't work? And then I also used it and used the calculator. How much is it going to cost to replant? How big of a mistake? I, did. I was scared as hell. But you know what? I ended up being my best beans. Then take the picture. Take pictures, guys. Pictures worth a thousand words. Always. I got some books. I forgot to hand them all. I mean, they're not the giveaway, but there's some books that you guys can look at to kind of see. Every year I put a book together of pictures because a picture's worth a thousand words. Look at that. You can see what I do. But that's what started out early. Neighbors are all saying, when is he going to plant that field? And I loved it because my dad would go to the coffee shop and say, oh, that was done three weeks ago. You guys are on the late show. And look at this. That soil is armored. See any weeds? Most of the grounds will argue, me, argue with on that. They say, no, that doesn't make a difference. Yeah, it does. But the one thing I have seen them say, okay, you're right. How about disease? Because you get disease from a raindrop falling down, hitting the soil, splashing on that unhealthy soil, and going up on the leaves. That's how you get disease. You know? And if I can armor the soil, I can stop that. What's that worth? And of course, at the end of the year, they're beautiful beans. They were my best beans. Now, we talked about rain. We talked about you know, some structure in the soil. They're picking sweet corn in a two and a half inch rain. Look at those tracks. They are just ripping that field up. No, they're not. No, they're not. When I was driving down here, I drove down from San Francisco along the coast. I saw these silage fields just rip the shreds. And I thought, whoa, we got a long ways to go, guys. We got a long ways to go. When you do tillage, it's a chain reaction. You will have to do tillage again to cure the roots. There's the ruts. Every time you do something, there's an effect, cause and effect. Now, a few things that I'm really excited about. Organic is great, but guess what? All the organic guys do a lot of tillage. So the no-till guys sit there and say, they're unhealthy because they're doing too much tillage. They're killing the soil. And the organic guy is saying, well, they're doing too much chemical. And I'm stuck here right in the middle, and these guys are pouring both ways, and I'm saying, you guys are both wrong. You're both right, and you're both wrong. Take the good out of everything. Leave out the bad. I think that's going to help me get to no-till organic. I'm super excited about 60-inch organic corn two years in a row. I'm going to grow my insecticide right in the middle. I'm going to grow my legumes. I'm going to grow my minerals, nutrients in between the rows. And then I'm going to come back the next year and plant corn again. Because really the corn is not going to be the dominant plant. The dominant plants will be everything I plant in the middle. All my pollinators, all my insects, all my soil health. Will I do that three years? No. But I think I can do two years. And it's exciting. I like to challenge myself. Everyone should challenge yourself. Will I succeed or fail? I don't know. If I fail, I still know I'm going to learn a lot. Pollinators. I was blown away with that. Because I thought I was a bird. I thought I was a bird. I took that picture, like, holy cow, you see that bird fly out in front of me? That's a butterfly, a big butterfly, doing what I want to do. Nowadays, that's my organic ground. That's how I transition. You're absolutely right, Beck. You know, most guys go to organic, oh, we'll just throw alfalfa in there and we'll rip everything, we'll pull every nutrient out, and we'll ship it away to somewhere else. Hell no. Let's put the livestock on there. Let's build that colony so when, when we go to organic, we have that micro pumping. And we're cycling nutrients. That's the big thing in, in organic world. It's about cycling nutrients or catch and release. Same basic idea. But my cows do it best. My grazing does it best. Do I need to work on my grazing? Yes. But you know what? I have a lot of acres to graze, so, you know, there's room for improvement, and I will get there, but that's how, that's why I network with, you know, everything I do, network with the right person, the right group of people. 
Now, cover crop grazing plan. Fall cover crops, I graze in the spring. June, August, I go to, through, June through August, I go to my pastures. And then September through January, I come back to my canning crop fields. There are really high, dense forages. Really good diversity, because that's how you're gonna, you know, grass finish. Because you can say grass fed, but if you want to be really grass, you need a grass finish. It's a very easy play on words, and people in the supermarket don't understand it. Oh, grass-fed? Well, most cattle are grass-fed. It's how they're finished that matters. V6 interseeding, I can graze that. And now with that uh, high-clearance machine, I can go into soybean and corn also. Graze as much as possible. Healthy as can be, except for this one. I just can never get that guy to look good. <laughs> now, what are my guidelines putting mixes together? Remember, I'm a chess player, not checkers. So I have my goals. I know what I want to get to. I look at the land's history and future. That's very important. How was that soil treated, and what do I want to do in the future? All right. What is the soil type, climate, current, weather pattern? That's huge. I don't go plant something if I know it's going to be bone dry. I make sure I get it in the ground. I change the way I plant. Livestock, used for grazing or forage. I always prefer grazing, but in Minnesota, i got to be realistic. I do have to have some forage cut and on hand for them. This year right now, today is the last day I'll be bale grazing. Remember how I said in my granite sweet corn, I was super excited how the bale grazing spots were? So now I'm purposely putting them all in my other fields. And then they're going to come back and they're going to graze another field. So I'll get through all of January and who knows February, March. Tillage practices. Just because you do tillage doesn't mean you can't work at it and try and get better. Still get the covers out. Try and reduce though because you will see the benefits. Know your seed provider. You guys, I mean, Keith has done a great job. I'm with Sal Butte. They do a great job. Be conscious of where you get that seed because if you just go buy from the neighbor, chances are legally you can't really buy it. Chances are if it doesn't grow, guess what? You just wrecked that friendship with a neighbor. That's not worth it. Put the money to the guys that know the seeds. And cost. Always think about that. When I do grazing, I up it because I know I got more return. If it's just a basic field I can't do much on or the future, the history or what I'm going to do, I can get pretty cheap. Now, make a big ripple, guys. All right? Everything you do, make a big ripple. Cover crop failures. You don't plant any. Yeah, pretty hard to see how it's going to grow if you don't do anything. That's why I at least grab it, John the apple seed style, and throw it out there. All right, Beck's, you know, throwing the shovel, the seed. Thinking you can't make it work in your field. Boy, the mind will, will definitely determine how you do. So always feel like you will succeed and learn from your failures. Networking with other farmers, super, super important. Because, yeah, it's nice to come here and listen to people speak, but find people in your neighborhood where you can drive that 10 minutes and look at their fields. All right, chemical mistakes. Don't let Roundup make you lazy and stupid. Uh, not realizing that everything is connected, because it is. And Dr. Bush is up next, and he's going to show you exactly, because everything he's going to talk about starts in the soil. Not using the right seed at the right time. A couple years ago, one of the farm magazines put something out about tillage rash flowing on in northern Iowa in late October. Didn't grow. Cover crops don't work. You freaking idiot. You didn't talk to a real good seed provider. You never put something out there, brassica like that, that, that late. You need to know how these plants grow. Start easy, start small, get a good provider. And now, for every action, there is a reaction. You choose if it's positive or negative. We all have that choice. And man, 
It's super important, now more than ever. And not listening to Mother Nature. She's telling us something. I'm scared. You guys have 600-year plans? Oh, I'm scared of that. Because I really hope there's a future in 600 years. Now, in the end, endless benefits for all. Healthy soil, healthy livestock, healthy people, generations, communities, everything you want. There you go, guys. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs>